At the beginning of the message, the Hebrews are called to attention. God is speaking. But in some respects, this is nothing new. Their beloved scriptures, the Tanakh, were filled with stories of God speaking to their fathers through the prophets. Our writer knows this, and he wants to capitalize upon it. And so what he does is he begins an existential discourse that is designed to take everything that they feel about God speaking to the fathers, multiply it times a thousand, and then land it in their relationship to Christ. So what's so cool here is that this is all a part of the author's pastoral practice. Remember, he's not writing a theology book. He's seeking uh, to edify and build up these Hebrews. They're in trouble and they need his help. And so everything that he does in this letter is designed, or in this message, is designed to help them. So he follows a two-step process. The first step is to demonstrate the uniqueness and the superiority of Christ over every other bearer of God's revelation. Whether angels or prophets, Christ stands above them all. That claim rests in a singular idea, and he expresses it this way. God spoke in a son. In, in the old times, in the former days, he says that the revelation came, and it was the word of God, but it came in many parts and in, in different modes. Those terms are used to speak of the fragmentary nature of that revelation. And those prophets were never able to fully reveal the Father. But now, in these last days, he said, he has spoken to us in a son. Now, the message and the messenger are one and the same. So having established Christ's unique ability to reveal the Father, the writer goes on to the second step in the process, and that is to connect everything that they feel about God's revelation to the fathers through the prophets to the revelation that has now come in Christ. Calhomer arguments provide this existential link. The Calhomer arguments are arguments from the lesser to the greater. Uh, given this is true, how much more this? They're used frequently in the Bible. Our writer uses them in a non-competitive way. He's not simply trying to say, oh yeah, ha, ha, Jesus is better than what you had in the past in some prideful, arrogant way. That would be a pointless activity. It, it's also unnecessary because even the Hebrews probably knew that Jesus was greater than the prophets and the angels. But what is his point? He's using these Calvahomer arguments to connect to the lived experience of these Hebrews. Uh, by arguing from the lesser to the greater, he's hoping to transfer everything, all the positive feelings that they had in their former belief system into their relationship to Christ. The matter of fact use of the Old Testament, the way in which the writer refers to things and feels no need to support them or argue for their validity, all points to the fact that the Hebrews had a very high view of the Old Testament scriptures. And in these Calvahomer arguments, this is the lesser position. If these truths from the Old Testament are so, and then you can see how Christ transcends them, how much more Jesus Christ. So what the writer is trying to do is not in some way disrespect the, the things that they had believed from the Old Testament, just the opposite. He's not presenting Christ through these arguments as the opponent. Rather, he's saying that he is the realization, the fulfillment of everything that was in these Old Testament stories. And in doing this, he is hoping to bring all of the intellectual, emotional um, outlooks that they ha had based on their former religion and bring them into their relationship to Jesus Christ. So no competition. We do ourselves a great disservice when we think that he's trying to dis Judaism because these people are going back to it. That's exactly the opposite. He's trying to build upon and utilize all the positive from Judaism in their relationship to Jesus Christ. Think of it this way. Suppose you were born blind and during most of your adult life, you were led around by a dear friend. Over the years, your love for and trust in this person had naturally expressed itself in immediate and complete compliance with his words. If you're walking down the street and he said, stop, you stopped because you knew there was danger. There's an entire emotional, intellectual, experiential world connected with the voice of your friend. Now, if suddenly one day your friend doesn't come 
and someone else comes in his place, you might intellectually know you should listen to this person, but that rational understanding does not line up with your experiential world. As a matter of fact, you might even resist because of distrust or confusion. However, if rather than this quick break, your other friend came and, and gradually introduced this person to you, you would find that, that as you walk together with the new person and the old person, your feelings of trust and love for the old person would gradually transfer to that new person. Now that's exactly what the writer of Hebrews is attempting to do. Not only in this chapter, these first two chapters, but in all of the Calvin Homer passages throughout the letter. And you'll find them in two, uh, chapter two, verses two and three, chapter six, verses 13 to 18, chapter nine, verses 13 and 14, chapter 10, verses 28 to 29, in chapter 12, verse 25. The writer has no interest in an abstract concept of Christ's superiority. Instead, he's forging a link, a connection between the experiential world of his readers and their relatively undeveloped relationship to Christ. And we know that it's relatively undeveloped because that's exactly what he says in chapter five, verses 11 to 14. So this is very pastoral by nature. These Calvin Homer arguments are a part of his pastoral approach.